Uh, yeah. I mean, she got the same emails everyone else did. So who's the vice chair? Is that Ron? Sarah? Sarah's the vice chair. Wasn't she the acting chair? Both. I didn't know if we have an acting vice chair when we had the acting chair. Okay. <laughs> not. Should we wait for Sarah or should we start? Um, Sarah said, okay, Sarah just emailed me. I'm waiting to join the webinar. Yeah, I don't know who would run the meeting if we don't have a chair or vice chair. Sarah just emailed me that she's waiting. So let's. Waiting? Yeah, she said, I'm waiting to join the webinar. In process. There's a bunch of people in the um, waiting room. Um, oh. And Sarah's one of them. Can you bring her over that way? Okay. And I don't think I don't know was. Promote to panelist. No, she's a presenter, right? Promote to panelist. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I don't know what the problem was. I'm just trying to get in. Am I muted? No. No, 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 you're good. Okay. Hello, Sarah. <sighs> Hello. Uh, and, we're also, and, and we're also joined by Andrew McDougall, new member, just came in. Right. I think we'll have a round of introductions, but I don't. It doesn't look like we have enough people yet. Is that right? No, you you have seven. Well, are we expecting, I know Sarah's not coming. How about Diana? Diana's here. here. I'm here. Oh, there you are. Sorry, everybody. Um, we're, we're missing uh, Miss Zobel, uh, who I did not hear back from when I contacted. Oh. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure what her status is. Well, all right, then why don't we get going? Um, I'm sorry to be, <laughs> pretty much the last one, don't know what the trouble was. Um, so before we tackle the agenda, I guess I should call the meeting to order, uh, the meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee, meeting at, call, call to order at 6.05 p.m. on Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. We are meeting virtually since we are not allowed to meet in person. Um, yeah, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Uh, so before we tackle the agenda, I think I would like everybody to introduce themselves. We have several new people, which is wonderful. And um, because I think we appear in different arrangements on different screens, I will just call on people um, by, by whom the committee that you represent, if you do represent one. I'm Sarah Marshall. I am a member of the LSSE Commission. Uh, Historic Commission, are you here? You introduce yourself. Unmute, there we go, there's unmute. Hi, I'm Robin Fordham, I, um, the Commissioner of the American Amer Historical Commission. Thank you. Housing Authority. Uh, David W. Williams, Housing Authority. All right. Hello, okay. okay, Conservation Commission, a new member. Hi everybody, I'm Anna. I am a commissioner on the Conservation Commission. I'm okay. very excited to be here. And how do you pronounce your last name, please? Devlin Gothier. And Gothier. it's Anna like the princess from Frozen. Okay. <laughs> okay, that I can remember. Um, planning board. Yeah, hi, Andrew McDougall. Um, happy to be here representing the planning board. Oh, in front of your Syrah, I think. So that's great. That's good. <laughs> Um, and we have some at-large members and so we'll, how about we start with the most uh, senior, by seniority that is. Uh, that's me, I'm Diana Stein and I'm a member at large and happy to be part of the group. Okay, next I think would be Sarah Isinger. She is not here tonight. So then Sam. Uh, hi everybody and new members, I'm Sam McLeod. Uh, glad to be here and glad to see that you're here as, as well. Okay. And uh, the newest member, at-large member, Katie Zobel, is not here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe she will drop in. We'll hope so. Um, so before we proceed, we do need a minute taker. Um, I think I'd like to pick on, a, on a, one of our 
someone who has served on the committee in the past, just to not put our new members, throw them immediately into the fire. So Robin did the previous set, I think. So would Sam or Diana be kind enough to volunteer? Uh, I'll do it if I can get a copy of the recording. Is that possible? Because yeah, I, I'll, I'll send I have a, few a little words. puppy here and sometimes I'll get up and I might miss something. I will send you a link when it goes live in the next couple of days. Okay, great. Thank you, Diana. Yes, you can watch the whole meeting again. So, Good. all right. Uh, then our first item on the agenda is to elect a chair and vice chair. I would suggest we just push that to the end. I agreed to chair this, you know, we voted to that I would chair this meeting. So let's do that and um, tackle that if necessary at the end of the meeting. In which case, I think I turn the floor over to Sean and so Sonia, who will tell us, try again to make me understand where our money comes from. Sean, you're muted. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm Sean Mangano, the finance director, and I'm lucky to be joined by Sonia Aldrich, the comptroller, who has lots of experience with CPA and will correct me if I say anything wrong. Uh, <laughs> So I'm gonna do a very brief overview of the CPA, mostly for some of our new members, just to hit some of the fine points about the calendar and the process, and then turn it over to Sonia to go through our available funds. And we'll be really brief so that we can spend most of the night on presentations. So I'm gonna share my screen for a second. Okay. All right, so what, what is the CPA? So. It is funded by a 3% surcharge on our property taxes that all the voters in Amherst at one point in our time uh, voted to do it. I think it started out at a, a lower percentage and ultimately went up to the 3%. Um, and it really can be used for four main purposes, um, affordable housing, recreation, historical preservation, and open space. And for the, some of the new members and, and you may already know this. There's a, a website, www.communitypreservation.org. Um, it's run by the Community Preservation Coalition. There's a lot of really good information on that website um, for learning about, there's FAQs and um, case studies and, and some good information on that website. This chart is something that I found helpful. Um, and these pictures, just if you're wondering, these pictures are projects that have been funded by the CPA. Um, I think our temporary chair is in one of them. Yeah, there we go. Our interim chair is in the background there for the Groff Park uh, ribbon cutting. And so basically this little chart, it has the four purposes at the top and then it has some different types of things you can do with projects on the left-hand side, um, acquire, create, preserve, support, and restore. And then you just kind of go across to see if it's something that's eligible. So sort of a matrix you can use to do a quick sort of pass on whether a project is eligible um, there's there's a lot of more a lot more nuance that goes into some of these things, but um, this is sort of a, a quick way to get a sense of whether something's eligible for CPA. Shifting to our timeline, so tonight is the first night of uh, three scheduled meet, uh, presentation meetings. Um, if we need more, we'll add more, but hopefully we can get it into the three that are scheduled. Um, and then on the after the fifth, which is the last night of presentations, on the twelfth there will be a public hearing where the uh, public can come and voice their support or give comments on any of the projects that were presented. And then between that meeting and the 19th, the committee will work on developing a recommendation, which is you know, a challenging process and, and may need more information um, from staff or from the presenters to do, to do their work. And then ultimately, if we stick to this calendar, the committee would finalize a report to the council on the third. Um, I'll just note that we moved this, pro this process up to the fall and it's a little more condensed than it's been in the past. Um, so we wanna to stick to the timeline, but we've left room in there where if you need to go later, there, there's room there to go later. And then some of the key steps in the process. So uh, your committee, the Community Preservation Act Committee, um, you're gonna hear presentations, review proposals, ask questions, um, hold the public forum. You'll do the prioritization of projects and consider funding strategies. And Sonia and myself and Anthony will help with some of those funding strategies to give you different ways you might be able to um, fit all the projects in or fit some of the projects in, consider borrowings, things like that. Um, and then ultimately develop and vote a recommendation. 
once you vote a recommendation, the finance committee will take that up. Um, and this year, again, because we moved the process to the fall, I think they're still deciding when they're gonna take up CPA's recommendation. Um, but the finance committee will review it and then make their own recommendation to the council. And then eventually the council will take both recommendations and vote to approve or, or not approve. And sometimes there's some exceptions to this rule, but in general, once the council votes to approve the recommendations, um, those funds become available to the requesters on July 1st. So again, because this process is a little earlier, if it, once it's approved, it'll be July 1st of 2021. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Sonia, who's gonna talk about the available resources for CPA. Okay, um, for, the, for the new members, I'm just gonna go through the whole thing again. Um, the top box is the current fiscal year. CPA, CPA is funded by um, estimated revenues. So until tax rate is set, we're estimate, it's just like a regular operating budget where we're estimating our local receipts and taxes that will be coming in to set that. So fiscal year, the beginning balance in fiscal year 21 is the only actual number we have right now on here. And that is what we ended our fund balance with 887,389. We're estimating that our surcharge will come in at 950,000. In our state match, right now, the state's telling us to use 17.7%. So our state match should come in around 168. It will come in a little more because we're 3% town now. Because of that, we get set round two and round three. Um, how to calculate that? I still haven't figured that one out. So I'm sticking with the 17.7%. The more we get in the end is good. Um, so for, for 21, we had $2 million available and we voted 1.256 in projects for fiscal year 21 with the current year that we're in now. We also voted $377,000 as a budgeted reserve. And what that is, is so that if something comes up during this fiscal year, we have a funding source to go to, to fund any projects that, that come off cycle. We, we get those from time to time. And there's been times that we haven't been able to fund them because we don't have any capital. The only way we could fund them is through borrowing and it has to be in our uh, project that can be borrowed for. So this 377 is kind of like our, our free cash, our municipal free cash where um, we voted in but at the end of the fiscal year, this goes away. So what happens is it just drops down to fund balance again, and it becomes part of the pot for the, for the following year. So, so far we have no projects. The reserve for historical preservation, that is $50,000 that was voted this year. Another rule of CPA is that you have to, sp you have to spend at least 10% of new revenue in that fiscal year for each of the three major categories and that's community housing, um, open space, and what's the other one? Historical preservation. Thank you. <laughs> Historical preservation. Op recreation is part of, op is, part of, is counted as part of open space. So that doesn't have it separate 10%. So with historic preservation last year, we didn't, we didn't meet that 10%. So we put 50,000 into a reserve for future appropriation for historic projects. And that, that reserve doesn't go away at year end, that stays there until we appropriate it for a historic project. And then we have returned appropriations and this is older, older projects that were completed and the funds weren't fully expended that get returned back in and that becomes part of the pot for the following year as well. And we had returned about $118,000 back. So for the end, we're estimating that at the end of fiscal year 21, we'll have um, 440,488. So that gets carried over into 20. So this, again, these are all estimates. So we're assuming that we're gonna take in a million dollars in surcharge and we're going back to the 11%, which is what the state started with for um, fiscal year 21, um, mainly because we really don't know where the budget's going with COVID going on and everything. So we want to be as conservative as possible. And that will give us 
1.55 million to start off with, with fiscal year 22. Then we, re, then we have to um, take care of our debt service from previous debt that was authorized through the committee. So we need to pay that. So we know that's gonna come off the top. So that's what that is, the 388,000. And then if we don't spend that budget reserve up at the top of 377, it will get carried down here and that will get added to the balance. So right now we have 1.16 million and most likely we will have the, um, the budget to reserve back in here because I don't know of any projects that are coming off cycle. Um, so the last box is just our debt service and letting you know what year they're due and what year they're coming on. Okay. Any questions on the um this piece of it, the financing. My only question is, is it possible for you to send this to us or is it possible for us to access this? Yeah, we'll- Mostly, is that okay? Yeah, we'll send this out. And the other thing I wanna mention, um, we have quite a few new members. So if anybody wants to do like a Zoom meeting with Sonia and myself um, outside of this and get into like the finer details of CPA okay. or ask questions, um, we're happy to set up a time to do that as well. Um, but we'll send this out to everybody. Thank you. I'll take you up on that, Sean and, and Sonia. I, I had one question though for the debt service. So are we are we approving projects in excess of our amount that is then financed that's carried as debt service? I'm I'm just trying to I don't know if you give me a high level overview of that super fast. You mean if we have three million worth of projects and only two million dollars in cash? Yes. That's yeah, I mean like like the right. I, I guess I guess the um and I appreciate that comment, but the um if we have, you know, the 1.5 million available and we find that we have projects that exceed two or 3 million, we could still approve them and that it would essentially be financed through future appropriations. You have to, no, you have to have an appropriation. So either you have to authorize debt for it or you have to have the cash in hand for it. Can I, can I interject? We can recommend to council that a specific project be funded through borrowing. And if they go ahead and do that, then yes, CPA funds pay it back over time. Right. And, and that's what you see down here on the debt service. These are the pay ongoing payments for CPA projects that were, you know, funded, that were approved, you know, 10 years ago now, we're just going to pay off the, the final installment of um, a rehabilitation project for the housing authority. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah, we can recommend projects in excess of the funds available to us, but it does constrain future, you know, future committees and what they can do because we're we're taking some of their. That was my exact. That, that's where I was going. Thank you, thank yeah. you all for clarifying that. And we can I add? I think we get we generally review this every meeting if they're you know especially if they're changes. Um, so it, this won't be the only time you right. say Anthony always has it at the ready, and we can go over it again, especially as as some of the estimated numbers get firmed up, and you know Sonia can figure out exactly how much money. <laughs> right. Once we get the actual state. Yeah years and stuff like that yeah right and i just ask a quick question um what are the dates that the estimated funds are expected to be final that always confuses me well for fiscal year 21 uh what comes in for surcharges and everything it's going to be right up until june 30th so that estimated balance the beginning balance for july 1 isn't until the previous fiscal year is all said and done okay you probably won't have actuals for your process that ends in December or around December. No. Yeah, yeah, we never do. I mean, fortunately, at least not in my experience, it's never been the case that, oops, there wasn't enough money to do what Right. Yeah, that's you know, what everybody doing. approved. So I don't know if that is the possibility, but. No, that's why we're very conservative in the numbers we use so that right. that never happens. And that's why you have a fund balance sometimes that carries forward because we might get a little more in than what was projected. Right. right. But it does appear that we have a smaller pot. The estimated pot this year is quite a bit smaller than last year's estimated pot. Yes? 
Well, remember that um, what that budgeted reserve will go back into the pot. So you can you can decide as a committee that you want to put that back into the pot for next year at some point. So we can we don't have to wait till the end of. No, because if you commit it for next year, then I can't allow it to be spent twice. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, I hate it when that happens. Okay. All right. So we could just we could just take that. <laughs> we could decide we're just going to take it. All right, but that's not anything more we need to understand or decide tonight, I guess. Right. Okay. Um, maybe, although Sonia, maybe you could go back if Anthony could throw that up again and you could point to the number which represents the new revenue, which of the various, the 10% are calculated. That has been confusing in the past. Okay, so each year it's it's the the current year's revenue, so it would be the the new tax assessment of a million dollars and whatever we estimate for the um, state match. So it's ten percent of those two numbers. So if you see the minimum over there, it's one eleven. We have to spend at least one eleven in each category, and for a lot of these, the debt handles that takes care of that right off the bat. Eleven thousand in each of those. Yes. Yeah. No. 111. 100. Oh, sorry. Yes. 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 I did 10 10 percent of 10 percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. But we have additional monies that we can spend on top of that. Right. You can spend more than 10 percent. Right. We we're held to actually spending or reserving at least 10 percent for each category. Right. Okay. Thank you. That was. I think that's enough on that. Um, so let's move to approve outstanding minutes. The only minutes we have to review are uh, from the September 10th meeting. Thank you, Robin. Um, can I just see first a show of hands? How many met? One, two, three, four, five. So we have seven members. How many people have reviewed them? And Robin, presumably. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's we can proceed. Um, and I'm told that even if you weren't at the meeting, you can uh, you can vote to um, approve or amend minutes as needed. So I would like to do this quickly. I don't. We have a lot to do tonight, so I don't want to spend a lot of time wordsmithing. Um, does anybody have a major comment? Any inaccuracies? Diana? I would just like the statement um, that I, it, it doesn't add anything to the minutes. I'll tell you which one it is. And I just like it removed, that's all. Um, yeah, let's see here. Um, and, you know, I didn't understand what two other Sonia Aldrich <laughs> was referred to. I do also think it's easier to follow if um, we use last names or uh, the initials to my mind are, are not convenient. So anyway, the, the line I'd like deleted, I, it says I, there was a, a discussion of item three under the proposal evaluation criteria. I know what was going on, but it doesn't add anything to the minutes and I would like to have it deleted. I'm sorry, I don't know which page or paragraph you're on. Um, it's under the proposal letter. Yes. And it says discussion of item three under proposal evaluation criteria, but it doesn't. Oh. Okay, I just right. would take it out. That's Robin, all. do you see that? Um, no, I'm it's not. the second. It's the second line above proposal form. I don't have no, it open. I, no. Uh, oh, okay. It's the one above proposal form. Okay. There's a SA comment, and then a DS comment is the second one above the proposal form. That's the line that I don't think adds anything. All right, maybe. Can maybe. I ask though? Isn't I isn't the purpose of minutes to track what happens in the meeting? It's not. It's not about what matters most in the meeting, isn't it? To so that people understand what occurred. Uh, it, that's, 
Anna, that's exactly my point. I don't think it explains anything. <laughs> it's not to be a transcript. It's to it's to describe every vote taken and who voted how and what the major right. discussions were and the major points. So, mm -hmm. um, so I guess, yeah, I guess my, my thought would just be if someone was worried you didn't talk about item three, um, you know, and, and now it's not in the minutes that you had talked about it at all. That would be my only concern. Yeah, I don't think that in this for that particular item that that's a concern so i don't remember if it's anthony who actually is going to be making all the changes I, just, to I, I see the line she's talking about i can i can remember okay that. so would you also please i'm sorry diana was there anything else no the other would have been like i said i i think it's easier well the two other sonia aldriches um and then yeah, I, I thought the last, oh, yeah. last so, names are easier than initials. That's all. Yes. Okay. I would like to add something where on the first page, after the list of people present, meeting call to order at 6.02 p.m., I would say on Zoom, again, as no in-person meetings are allowed. Um, uh, under review financials, the second paragraph, so to speak, says estimate of 1.38 million for funding. Please add in the fiscal year 22 round. Okay. Okay, good. Um, the next paragraph, kind of the end of that paragraph, HB reported where it says closer to question mark, question mark. Just say that the the amount returned will increase somewhat. Okay. Um, and then at the end, very almost the end, it says Sept 24th meeting, meeting, any reason to have this? In the end, no. <laughs> um, at the time where our, our next meeting was going to be either October 15th or October 22nd, and I was going, I will decide that. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right, anything else? Uh, yes. I just agree with Diana's comment regarding the names. Uh, I'm not sure who would affect it or if we have to confirm it. Uh, my preference would be first name, first initial, last name, either or works. Uh, if we stick with, the initials, I, my preference would be for the SML to be just S Mac. Because I, I was Ella, I, the, the initials were just a, a shorthand for taking notes. I understand. I, I, I apologize. I, maybe we can agree on a standard and then whoever takes that notes for me. just do the replace once they're done. But when I was Thank taking Thank you for taking the notes, by the way. It's, oh, sure. It's, it's <laughs> in real time. Uh, and the only other comment is I'd add an A to my name at the top. It's S. McLeod, M-A-C-L-E-O-D. That, that gets important to us who have heritage between iron and Scott. <laughs> People come to blows over that. Yeah, A or not. I second that, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, glad we have that settled. Um, all right, any further comments? I move that we approve the minutes as amended. I second. All in favor? Do we have uh, to, do we have to, all right. Marshall, McLeod, Gauthier, Fordham, Stein. Did anyone else? Williams, approved. All right. I, I'm an abstain by the way. And thank you. And McDougall's abstaining, which is fine. Thanks. All right, I believe Sonia has left. I think she just turned her camera off. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Anthony, do we have any members of the public? Uh, okay, so anyone who is in attendance uh, who is not one of the people presenting, if you would raise your hand. Uh, we've got Meg Gage. I'm going to promote you to a panelist now, Meg Gage. Meg, you're muted. There, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, 
the, I'm uh, on the steering committee of the District One Neighborhood Association, and we've submitted a proposal. Uh, we've got some excellent, helpful feedback from the Historic Commission earlier this week, and um, realized there's some points that we actually have planned, but in order to make it a succinct proposal, didn't include. So I wanted advice on augmenting the proposal. And also, uh, my uh, ineptitude uh, in attaching photos, I can't, I don't know why I couldn't. I tried three different formats <laughs> of photos, but I wanted advice. Maybe um, Anthony or somebody could help me attach, help us attach the photos that give you a good picture of what's involved with the trail. Yeah, Meg, I can, uh, I can reach out to you tomorrow about that. Great. And uh, and you will and you will have a presentation at a future meeting. We will right. I know. So I'm just asking about whether we should submit. I mean, there were things. For example, we want to have QR codes so people can access the information with their phones and hear the students' voices telling the stories of who lived where. And we just didn't include all that detail because my training is keep it tight and short. <laughs> but I thought it would be. It isn't to change anything, but it's to augment some of the ideas if maybe you could help me with that too i don't know if the procedure we have, is we have to augment the proposal we have historically allowed people to supplement their proposal supplement. thank right. you so, meg you, you just just send your additional document or uploaded photos or whatever whatever to anthony and he'll yeah. get them out right. to the committee yeah. i also want to put in a huge uh vote of support yeah. from everyone in north amherst for the north amherst library uh, proposal where we have one of the oldest uh, historic buildings in town. It's a total treasure. Many of our kids learn to read there. Uh, and we're so fortunate to have an anonymous donor who's supporting a huge amount of the uh, improvements there, like a restroom, for example, in a community room. We don't have, like many parts of town, we don't have a real community space up here. Uh, and we're, would really, I've just, representing a lot of people supporting the North uh, Gilbert's proposal uh, for the North Amherst Library. It's it's a really big opportunity for CPAC to make a difference. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll Thank be in touch with you, Anthony, tomorrow. Okay. And thank um, you for letting, for the public comment. Sure, thanks for attending. Is there anyone else? Does it appear that there's anyone else? Raise your hand now or forever hold your peace. Well, Unless until the next, next meeting. Yeah. yeah. I don't see anyone else raising their hands. All right, so we can begin the presentations. All right. And I maybe I can just tell the, the new folks on the committee, we these are fairly informal. The presenters get to you know, summarize their project if they want, and then we have questions and answers, or sometimes we just launch directly into questions. So uh, we'll um, give the presenters an opportunity to say whatever they would like to. So one quick preface uh, for all of these folks. Uh, I only received questions from three committee members. Um, I, sent the, I sent those questions to the presenters um, in some cases, they would have received them only this afternoon because one. Um, so, uh, and I haven't. I, I actually never really asked for written responses back because I didn't really know what to do with only three sets of questions. Um, so, uh, you may we, we this may now be a good time after they're finished speaking to ask your questions. I'm going to bring in Guilford Mooring for our first presentation. And um, if Alan Snow or anyone else from DPW is in there, some of these, some folks in the attendees list are anonymous. If anyone else from DPW is here, you can raise your hand. Uh, Guilford, you can just tell me when you want me to show anything. Uh, but uh, the floor is yours. So which one is first? I don't really have an agenda. Uh, I, put, I, put, I put the library first. It's, uh, up okay. To you. So you've already you've already heard a little bit about the library. Um, we've been working with Coon Riddle um, through the generosity of an anonymous donor. We've done a lot of planning for the library and come up with some um, some good concepts. 
there is a, the town manager is going to form some type of committee, building committee for this project that will help um, see this as it goes forward into um, construction. It's just that your process now is, is starting now. And if we were to wait until we get into the building committee and so forth, we'd be a little out of sync with your process and wouldn't meet the construction schedule we have right now. So that's why you're seeing this now. Um, one of the things we did find very early on in the process is that there was some alterations made to the building and those alterations are causing this damage to the wall. Um, you have some pictures that I sent and shows the, uh, the beam that was cut uh, to put the stairway in. Uh, the stairway goes from the main vestibule down into the, into the basement now. Um, the original entrance to the basement was actually through the back of the library. There's a large window. If you go to the library, you can see a large window in the back of the building. That was the entrance into the basement and it was decided that's not acceptable. So they put the stairs in, but they cut this main beam. There's some, uh, there's some rearranging in the building, which is not really very good. And this wall is starting to roll in. So we wanted to ask for some money to just work on this wall to take down the support system there is. And it's going to probably be some type of form of buttressing that we use to hold the wall back up. We're taking the stairs out. We're going to put the beam back in. The entrance to the basement will be re-established into the basement from the back of the building, mm -hmm. uh, which will actually be the middle of the building when the new additions added onto it. The back of the building will have a stairway which goes down to the basement and one which goes upstairs to the first floor. And there'll be a lift which will take you between the middle floor, which is going to be the addition floor, and the top, the first floor. Um, so that's basically the project. Um, the estimates we have are from Coon Riddle. Um, there is a contingency in there. It's about 20% right now because we do not know what's behind the foam insulation. We haven't taken that down yet and um, we don't know what's behind it. So we gave a pretty hefty 20% contingency to it. Um, I think uh, that is everything about the proposal. And I think I got all three of your questions. Um, any other questions? Uh, this is Sam Guilford. Thanks for the presentation. Just a quick confirmation to make sure I understood what you said. Uh, the existing stairwell is going to be removed in its entirety and not replaced. And there's going to instead be a new entrance with new stairs from the back window area. Is that correct? Yes, the actual entrance will be a little bit to the, if you're looking at the back of the building, it'll be a little to the right of that window. I have a question, Gilford. Thank you. Um, is this does this work need to be done before all the other work that is funded by the private gift? No, we're, we're hoping to actually dovetail this work in with the work that the private donor is doing and uh, kind of co um, economize on a, making a bigger project out of it and have just one closure and one big project and then come out with one final project at the end, final product at the end. Yeah, no, but I meant more, is it is it necessary to do the work before the other work can be done? I, I know no, that. No, it's not. Okay. They can be done together. But it, it makes sense to do them together, but yes. it's not like the other work couldn't happen. If we, well, if you decide not to, fund it, there's going to have to be some type of, uh, something's going to have to be done with that wall to make some, make some changes and stabilize it so that the work we do for the new addition isn't compromised by the wall at some point in the future. Anybody else? Um, just, I'm assuming that the justification under historic preservation is just the historic nature of the building. Um, is there anything in the budget that is really a specific historic preservation expense? Um, I'm just thinking of the slate roof projects, which, you know, the slate themselves is um, a specialized process that requires specialized trained people. Um, where's this? I'm just trying to get a sense of that portion of the budget. 
Um, there is no special historic preservation skills required for doing this wall. No, I don't okay. think so. But it is it is important to the integrity of the structural integrity of the building. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. The, no, the I got building. that. I was just uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just. Yeah. yeah. No, I got that. I just was wondering if oh, yeah, it was yeah, just, the thing specific as well. But okay. Right. So it is essentially because the building is historic, it is necessary to preserve the integrity of the historic building. Okay. Yes. Do you happen to you... know, Guilford, if the uh, stairwell access new one is for the general public or for staff. I, my understanding from last year's presentation, there was some, uh, it was primarily for those who were working there. Do you have any indication regarding that? How the library will operate has not been fully worked out yet. The uh, Sharon Sherry, the head librarian, has been discussing how she would operate a library with two floors and the staffing she has at the time right now. So she has not come up with an actual plan for that. And that's something that has to be something she still has to work out. Thank you. Does, does the basement level need a second exit to be used by the public or as a workspace? Or is this just where the mechanical systems are put? Uh, Again, we don't know how they're going to use the library, this, this basement space for the library. So right now, a lot of the space is going to be for mechanical sections of the building and for um, just general storage and support of the building. Um, it, there does not need to be, because of the size of the building and the, and the way the basement's set up, it's pretty much an open space in the basement. There does not need to be a second exit from that, sm that space is what we're being told. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, yeah. Gilford. I have a quick question for you. Oh, sorry, Andrew. No, you're up. You want to rock, paper, scissors it? All right. Um, so oh, are I you- I care. I choose. Anna. Uh-huh. <laughs> Anna. Anna. Um, so Anna. it's OK. It's all right. I'll dress up like the princess next time. Um, so I, my question is just, are you re-insulating that wall? And are you putting consideration into sustainability of materials and, and things along those lines? Or is that further down the road? You're not there yet. So the building has actually been insulated really well so far. Um, so we will have to take some type of additional insulation when we pull out the other stuff. Um, that has been included in this project for that one section. And then the overall project, there's a lot of sustainable practices in the overall project, which will upgrade the existing heating and cooling system as well as lighting and um, lighting, heating and cooling. And there was one more system which just went in. Electri and electrical? Electrical is pretty much up to up to work. Can't really can't really get much better with the electrical. Yeah. yeah. Great. That sounds great. I was just wondering if you were ripping out insulation and re-insulating if you had. You are. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Hey, Guilford. Um, yeah, I was I was I guess just curious. The obviously the it was unanticipated that we we're going to have the issue with the wall when the work was originally done. Right, the, the thought was that that temporary uh, uh, or that fix was actually a permanent fix or was it always intended as a temporary one? From what we can tell, it was only a temporary fix. It was meant that at some point something had to be done with the wall. As we started looking at what we're doing to the building overall, it was quite evident that there's a chance that without doing something to this wall, we would lose the front of the building specifically we'd lose the entryway that might be lost if we start making these changes and not um, address the wall issue okay all right i think that i think that covers me thank you any more questions all right then guilford thank you very much for attending tonight uh, well, Guilford, Al Guilford also has uh, the Mill River Pool. Okay. Oh, is that follow immediate? Oh, okay, then let's move on to the Mill River Pool Repair. And we did get some late video uh, and photographs, I think. I don't know. Did anyone? Who, who was able to see? Who had time to look at those? I saw the photos. All right. I wonder, Anthony or Gil, somebody could... If you want, I think it would be helpful to see the video yep. at some point, but I'll let Guilford 
um, maybe narrate what's <laughs> what's happening. Is this working? Or is it? Uh... Yeah, we see. Well, we don't. Yeah. I hope I have a player. Yeah. So what you're what you're seeing in the video is how the paint is uh, the paint sticks very well to the uh, the current concrete of the pool, but um, it pulls when it starts peeling and popping. It actually pulls the the, the existing current concrete surface away from the rest of the concrete, and um, that's what we're trying to with this proposal. We're hoping to clean and treat the pool so that when we uh, paint it and that the paint doesn't pull out sections of the concrete with it when it comes out. Um, that's really what that video is showing. And then the cracks or the cracks that we have that have to be uh, in the treatment process, we want to seal those cracks up. The, he's not in the deep end, but the deep end is the worst part for cracks. And because of the high groundwater, the cracks actually fill the pool over the winter with water in the deep end um, but so sand blasting and sealing those would uh, alleviate that problem so overall it's just a general maintenance of the pool the pool was installed in the 70s and there's not been anything done to the existing concrete structure in the 50 years almost 50 years it's been there uh, we keep, we're at the point now where every year we end up having to scrape and repaint the pool. Um, we keep pulling off a layer of the concrete. So our goal here is to sandblast all the paint off, do a professional job of resealing the concrete and repairing the concrete areas, and then put a high quality paint on it that will at least last five years before we have to actually start doing touch-ups on the paint. Um, and hopefully that will extend the pool for another 40 or 50 years. Um, the pump we got and we put we put in the new pump that was for money from last year or the year before and that pump is you can actually go in the pump room and have a conversation with the pump running it's such an efficient and much better pump than it was before so we thank you for that and then we did some upgrades inside the bathhouse and the bathrooms a few years before and we're also doing we actually we're just kind of working through everything in this park we have the Basketball courts we'll start working on this year and in the next year, and we've already done the tennis court. So to keep this as a viable, usable facility, we definitely want to just take the concrete pool, uh, clean the concrete, repair the concrete areas that need to be repaired, and then put a high quality paint on it that will last for a few years before we have to start actually touching it up. And then hopefully we get a five years out of the paint and maybe five years out of touch up before we actually have to do this major, major paint jobs that we do right now on it every year. So that's the project as a whole. The numbers came from a quote from a vendor. We brought a vendor in who examined the pool. He went through some pretty detailed examinations. Um, he actually had a device to actually measure some moisture in the, in the sides of the pool and do some other things with it. So we're pretty confident the estimate's good. Um, we're public works. We always have a contingency number in there. So there is a contingency number in there. Um, so. Uh, I think that answers, that tells the project and answers those two questions as well. Is there any other questions? Andrew. Thank I you, Sarah. Uh, okay. Andy. All right. Um, yeah, Guilford, I was just curious. Um, yeah, the, 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 I think in the, the quote, it was like $12,000 in material and 65, and then the other, you know, 40 or so. I assume, is that all labor? Or is that also like concrete materials? Um, $50,000 is, is the labor to do the sandblasting to, and to make the repairs. And then there's a twelve to $15,000 number we were given for the actual concrete material they would use. So the $50,000 covers um, um, labor mostly of chipping and, and doing all that. And then the final paint is in there too. But the concrete number they thought was going to be between twelve and fifteen thousand. So that's where the contingency is built in. Okay. And then, do you have a sense of what it costs today annually? All that work you're doing, uh, uh, you know, repairing the concrete, painting regularly. Like, what's what's that cost about today? 
it's probably about five thousand dollars every season in labor and material. Okay. Great. That's that was my questions. Thank you, Guilford. Sam. Uh, I just have a comment. Um, I was a painting contractor for a number of years, and I also worked with the Sherwin Williams Company for a number of years. Uh, I don't envy the challenge of painting a pool. I, I get, you know, my opinion both ends of the spectrum is that's got to be one of the most challenging types of surfaces to deal with. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that you are including sandblasting in there because trying to adhere to the substrate would likely pull the paint out. So uh, the expense, I have no idea what the current estimate would be from people who are looking at it, but I do know that pools and this type of work is dramatically more involved uh, from an expense standpoint than what one would envision as a typical job. And I know that the high-grade epoxies are also not like a typical can. They're very much a premium. So uh, good luck with it. <laughs> I hope it goes well. It's a challenge. It should come out, it should come out really well, we think. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I've got a, a question. Um, oh, actually, two. Uh, it, one that it, that I'd written, but I didn't hear an explicit answer. Is if after sandblasting you find more extensive damage, will you need more funds? I, I kind of I meant to. I hope I covered yeah. that, but I guess I didn't. Okay. Um, the person who did the analysis is pretty sure that the the high end is fifteen thousand dollars worth of concrete work. Um, he thinks it's more in the twelve thousand dollar range, so okay. the fifteen thousand is his extra extra if, if something goes south on him and he actually misguessed. Right. Okay. Thanks. And and that crack that you said is is taking in water. That means it's a full depth crack. Well, the crack you saw was on, yeah. higher up in the pool. The crack you didn't show. There's two cracks down the deep end of the pool. They're the ones that are full depth, and they're the ones that are letting water in. Um, okay, is that a challenging repair then? You have to. <laughs> it is a, it's a bit of a challenging repair, but it's doable in the, in the scope of the work, and he's comfortable with the numbers he gave us. Okay, I mean, we're in a drought, so I guess it'd be easy to do it now, but the water table rises again, then maybe. <laughs> if you want to live someplace with a high water table, you should live around Mill River Pool. It's high all the time. Oh, okay. All right, any further questions, Andrew? Yeah, I just had one follow, I, I, I think I know the answer, but just since you are, are, are there any are there any safety concerns with the current technique of having to do this work, uh, you know, every season paint flex that might get in the water that, you know, might be ingested or things like that? Um, we, well, we do, we do have every once in a while, we have someone who points out there's a lot, of, there might be a, a, a pool of paint flex somewhere on the bottom of the pool and their kids are playing with it. Um, that's more towards the end of the season with the pool most of the years. Um, we've had had that comment made. Um, there's not been a lot of it going on, so it's not that much of a safety issue, but it would be nice to kind of stop it and make it look a little more like this is the pool for the next 20, 30 years. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> All right, then I think that does it for the pool. Right, thank you, Guilford. Thank you, Guilford. Thank you very much. If you have okay. any more questions, just let us know. All right, thanks. Bye. All right, uh, is anyone in the audience from the Goodwin Church, Nancy or, or anyone else? There's a couple anonymous people in the attendees list. If, oh. if, any, if anyone there is from Goodwin Church, could you raise your hand? I had confirmation from Nancy that they'd be attending. Oh, there we are. Okay. Uh, Galaxy tab. <laughs> Is this Nancy? Whoever's using the Galaxy tab needs to unmute at least if it's Nancy.
Got it now? Yep. Yes. Hey, I'm new to this. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. Please do introduce yourself since we don't see a name. Sure, my name is Nancy Schroeder and I'm a member of the Goodwin Memorial African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in Amherst and I'm on the board of trustees there. So Nancy, the way this normally goes is um, if you want to spend a couple of minutes talking about your project, expanding on any of the points you made, I know you got some of the questions a little late that if you were able to address them. And then after that, the committee will pepper you with any other questions they have. And if you need me to call up any documents for you, uh, let me know. Thank you. Um, the church was built in uh, 1910 by uh, members of the congregation. And uh, we share as members and friends, we share a strong spiritual fellowship at Goodwin and we have a great gospel choir and we have a beautiful sanctuary. The one thing that we lack is generational wealth. And the reasons for this lack of uh, generational wealth are manifold and um, I guess built into the structure of our nation. It, it boils down to the fact that as a majority African-American church, we don't have bequests and we don't get large gifts coming in and we don't have wealthy supporters. So we have members who uh, tithe and give more when needed, but we still operate on a shoestring budget and maintenance room rep repairs have been deferred for years. Uh, in 2019, the church collaborated with the uh, Amherst Interfaith Opportunity Network and had a very successful community fundraiser to raise, uh, to restore Goodwin Church. And those funds so far have been used to replace the furnace and oil tank, repair windows, remove trees hanging over the church, uh, remove moldy plywood walls and ceilings, uh, and make other minor repairs. Um, we currently have $22,000 in our restoration fund. We wanna reshingle the roof and rebuild the chimney and install uh, insulation in the attic and the walls. And the estimate to do the work is about $24,000 based on estimates that I got from three contractors for this work. We're asking for a grant of $12,000 from the CPA and the church will match this amount um, from our restoration fund. Um, but in addition, um, on the advice we received at the historic commission meeting, we're including a 25% contingency budget line in case the work is more expensive next year. Um, this amount would be an additional $6,000. So we're asking the CPA to fully fund the contingency line item and increase our original funding request to 18,000, which you, I, you don't have in writing. Uh, and any funds that are not spent on these three repairs would be returned to the CPA. Um, so with the CPA's funding, the church's roof will be replaced, the chimney rebuilt and the insulation installed. And the church would still then have about $10,000 in its restoration fund to address other maintenance and repair issues in the future. Um, the questions that were uh, sent to me this afternoon was, uh, one of them was whether we've applied for other funding. Uh, we have not so far. We thought we would stay, do this local first, locally first. Uh, so we haven't gone to other funding organizations. And um, the other was um, if there's rot in the uh, sheathing, um, would we have the money to uh, replace that? And the uh, contractor uh, did go up into the access pan panel and take a look around and he did not find uh, rot in the, in the uh, plywood sheathing. So, um, but the price would be, or the cost would be in terms of what he gave us as an estimate would be um, I think it's like $3.20 a square foot. So that's about $100 for a um, uh, four by eight piece of plywood. And uh, so that's about all I know. Um, or can, you know, that's, that's, that's my presentation beyond what we have written. And um, 
I look forward to your other questions. Thank you, Nancy. Do any of the committee members have questions about this proposal? <laughs> Bam. Uh, Nancy, you referenced twelve thousand dollars. I'm looking at a number of twenty four thousand two hundred and forty on something I printed out here that includes the chimney, attic wall, mm -hmm. and roof repair. Mm -hmm. uh, right, and that's twenty four. And what we're saying is, we will pay. Can we match? Can you give us twelve thousand dollars, and we will match the twelve thousand dollars from our funds? And then at the historic commission, they said, well, you probably should add a contingency. And uh, so I'm asking the CPA to front the contingency. So that would be 18,000. Okay. Any other questions? I did have one, but it's more of an internal matter. It's about whether insulation would mm -hmm. qualify. Right. Um, right. So I, my idea is that, that roof and chimney repairs, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's straightforward, no promises, mm -hmm. but right. and, and any contingency associated with those two areas of work yep. would that be eligible, sense. but I don't know about the rest. So the insulation, I just, right. I just, I just yep. raised that. Yep. I heard that uh, at the historic commission too. Oh, okay. I mean, and then the other good news, it, it might be good news, is that the um, Center for Ecological Technology um, might subsidize um, the insulation. So it it probably is something we could pick up. And, and um, yeah, I can just add that um, we'll discuss it. We're meeting again, the Historic Commission again is meeting next week. And um, Jane Wald is the better expert on um, what's generally covered in terms of preservation and rehabilitation and what's not. So we'll get a more definitive idea from her. That's right. And I think she was the one who raised it. Yep. She knows her stuff. <laughs> it's certainly a church that is part of Amherst history. Uh, yeah. As a kid, I had the Woodside Avenue paper route. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember looking back in that area and uh, I found it a really cool spot from my yeah. perspective at that time. Uh, this church and others, there's the other one on uh, Gaylord, uh, along with other buildings. It's uh, from a longtime Amherst resident. I, you know, this is a, a building that is part of the uh, history of Amherst for sure. That's right. Any other, Diana? I have a question for Anthony. Um, is it okay to up a grant proposal request like this um, for the contingency fee, which uh, I feel is a valid request? I just don't know about adding it on. I, I don't. That's I don't. I don't believe there's any issue with changing the request amount in either direction at this stage. Okay. The, good. After we, rec after we recommend it, the town council cannot then increase it, but, uh, but we I, I am not aware of any reason they can't make that request at this stage. Okay, and it, it could actually be that if the Center for Ecological um, Technology or whatever the CDG stands for, that there'll be some reduction in that in the insulation costs. So, mm -hmm. you know, right. It, well, okay. it, it sounds like I should uh, revise the budget and return it to you, for, you know, send it back in to you folks um, with the contingency. I just, we just haven't put it in writing. Yeah, I think that'll be, help. that'll be helpful. It'd yeah. be good for the record, yes. Yeah. Good. good. Andy. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, I, I actually, Diane, you, you jumped on a little bit of what I was going to say. I, um, I would ask, or just, is the insulation that you're doing, is it spray foam? Is it rolled in? Like, and apologies if I missed it in the proposal, but. Um, uh, you know, hang on. And the reason why, I, like, I just, when I saw the number two, I was thinking, this is a comment, not a question, uh, but I've had worked under my house and like, those seem like pretty fair prices. Like I, I would be concerned given the age of the house. Um, Obviously, if you've got three quotes, that's great. 
but well, I think contingency no. is a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. No, I just I got th I I got one quote for each each item. I didn't okay. get three from three. Um, got it. Let's, okay. uh, let's see. Uh, do, do, do. Uh, cellulose open blow yeah. would be in the attic, and then the walls would be cellulose dense pack. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It just uh, once you get into system stuff, um, you, who knows what you're going to find, like pulling walls apart and so forth. So, um, mm -hmm. anyhow, uh, thank you for the time and making the presentation. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Any remaining questions? All right, thank you, Nancy. All right, thank you. Now we're looking, Anthony, you're muted. We're looking for Wayling. Yes, Wayling Greeny. Who should be coming in. Hi, Wayling, you're muted. Hi, I am going to unmute myself. Yep. Well, uh, I think you can, uh, you know how this works. I think you can. Yes, I do know. I'm going to, hi. Hi. Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I see quite a few familiar faces here. So it's a pleasure to being here today. And I apologize, I did not have the uh, written response back to you since I didn't get the questions until about uh, 20 <laughs> So I'm happy to verbally explain to you. And if you'd like me to do the written response, I'm also happy to do it. So um, how should I do it? I can do, the written res uh, I can do the verbal response to your questions or I can do my presentation first. Do you have any preference? Presentation. Right, I will say presentation first. Okay, thank you. So my name is Waylin Greeny and I am the founder and executive director of Amherst Community Connections. Thank you for having me here tonight to discuss the phase three supportive housing program. Thank you for believing, for believing in ACC when your committee funded first in 2016, the very first and only supportive housing project for the chronically homeless in the state. Since then, you have further provided funding to ACC for the phase two supportive housing program in 2018. I'm here tonight to present our phase three supportive housing program to you. If you approve of the funding request, we'll start in 2021. So with two successful supportive housing programs behind us, I hope that you will consider our funding request. So I want to summarize for you for the successes and accomplishment we have done in the phase one and phase two. So in a short four years, that 23 people we have housed in studio or one bedroom apartments through the funding that you provided to ACC for the housing purpose. And of those, 17 have graduated or they are completing the program as we speak. And 14 have received permanent housing vouchers. And three currently in the housing that we provide, they are working diligently to achieve housing stability and financial stability. And to be eligible for the program, they have to be people are disabled. So 100% of the people we admit into the program, they are disabled and combined, uh, I mean, and also they have to be chronically homeless. So on average, they have been homeless for 10 years or more. And because we have to screen them in, for those who are more disabled, we want them. So instead of rejecting them for their past, uh, you know, rental history or substance abuse or criminal background, we want them to be in the program because we believe the barriers for their success in achieving housing stability has to do with the fact that they have been rejected, dismissed by the mainstream housing programs. So about 
45, 50% of them, they suffer trimorbidity, meaning that they have co-occurring mental substance use and chronic medical conditions. And about 45% of them, when they first enter into the program, they have no income whatsoever. And about 50% of them, they have had criminal issues in the back, larceny, assault and battery, substance uh, use or substance uh, selling. And, uh, you know, that's what got them into the legal realm. And we look at the breakdown, about 50% of the people that we housed in the program so far in the past four years, they are people of color, minority groups, Asians, some, and by and large are African-Americans or Hispanics. And about 65% of them, they are males and the 35% are females. And they are an older group. Their average age is about 50 to 60, 55 to 60 years old. And uh, it takes us between six to nine months to get them to graduate, to receive their permanent housing voucher and be on their own. So imagine that they have been homeless for years, years and decades and decades. But because you believe in us, giving us the funding to rent apartment for them, and we provide a support service. So your money goes a long way. So for every person we graduate, it costs $7,000 from you. And we have to raise $5,000 to do the social service support. And these are funds from us, not from you. It's the social service component. So the overall cost between the housing and the support service it costs 12,000. And I want to give you a perspective. We have done the research in my two years ago application for the similar program, phase three, but that was the research done. We found it costs about $35,000 per person who has experienced chronic homelessness. It's the social cost, the time they spend in jail, in detox, in crisis, center, in emergency room, all these things, there's a social cost and has been dissected, estimated, it costs the society $35,000. So if we can, between your funding, 7,000 and our fundraising, 5,000, together put $12,000 on the table that we can save the taxpayers who would normally have to pay 35,000. So the saving is substantial. So we are very pleased for the success of the participants who have been in the program. So you might ask me, so why phase three? Aren't you finished your work? People who are chronically homeless shouldn't have been all done? No, unfortunately, we still continue to see the presence of the people who experience chronic homelessness. As you know, the housing in Amherst is so unaffordable and they are competing with students, with others who have more money than they do. And yet many of them have deep roots in Amherst. I have some participants right now, for example, they have uncle and aunt. They retire from our local elementary school, well-respected well -respected teachers from Fall River. And yet this person experienced chronic homelessness. And I have another participant whose uncle is a famous UMass faculty member who has deceased in the music department. So they all have roots here in Amherst. So the continued unaffordable housing in Amherst has made it difficult, if not impossible, for them to rent a place. And as you might know, the worsening of the economics has contributed to some extent to the housing instability because the loss of income, loss of job means that likely to become uh, rent arrears and unable to pay their rent. So their likelihood of becoming homeless is so much greater. So I want to tell you that the supportive housing program really works. This is a very effective way to address the systematic uh, racism in our society. 
even over 50% of the participants are people of color that we serve. And also by supporting this phase three, supportive housing, you are helping preventing the spread of COVID-19. As you know, COVID-19 means people who have no roof over their head, they are out and about, really making it hard for them to shelter in place. And for every chronic person that ACC is able to help through your generous support, we, are be, we will be able to support the taxpayers every year, $28,000 per person. So if you multiply that by the number of years, number of people that we are able to pull out of that, recycle the perpetual cycle of in and out of jail or in and out of mental institution, it's in the half a million dollars real. So with that said, um, I would go, I'll finish my presentation. So now if I could go to answer the questions that you have and then I'll be open for questions. Does that sound okay? All right, good. So I received uh, seven questions. So the first question was, is this phase three, we submitted the same as the last one we submitted two years ago? The answer is yes and no. The concept is the same. You get the people who are chronically homeless housing first. You provide support service as they are housed. The concept is simple, it's the same. However, what are the differences? Well, the difference is that we now have secured more service providers on site that they can come to see their doctor, Dr. Fossey from the homeless uh, health care for the homeless. And we have a worker from Wayfinders, they are on site to help do the raft, which is housing financial support to meet your moving costs last month security deposit. And we have another person from uh, Bay State Hospital, also under the healthcare for the homeless. She does mass health enrollment. So that's one in-house support service, service providers we have secured. And the second difference is that now because of COVID-19, we provide tele-support, meaning we don't have to have you on site to do case management with you. We use technology, whether it's FaceTime, whether it's Zoom, whether it's just simply a phone conversation, we can do a lot of things that we can, can do face-to-face. -face. Of course, everybody prefer face-to-face, -face, but during COVID-19, we do not let COVID-19 stop us from providing support service but we augment the face-to-face, -face, which we still do with tele-support. So that's the big you know, difference compared to the one that we submitted two years ago. The second question is about the uh, administration fee of $60 that we charge. So here is the explanation. In 2016, when we received funding from CPA, we were provided with $50 at the administrative fee for the housing uh, program. And in 2018, two years later, we received $55 per unit from the uh, CPA. So this program will start in 2021. So we asked to raise that by $5. So that's one answer from the $50 to $60 after five years. And what do we use the money for? Well, as you know, people, they come to the program, if they have a little bit income, they have to contribute 25% of their measly income, whether it's social security, disability income, or emergency income from the state, which is $300 a month compared to the social security disability income, which is $750. So we have to help them by paying for their fees to stay in the program because if they have income, they need to contribute 25%. So we help them to secure money order because many of them are having challenges to do to negotiate with the banking institution or with the postal service so that's one thing we do have to spend time to coach them every month 
And sometimes they don't have the money to pay in the beginning of the month. So we have to give them $10 this time and $20 next week. Just the whole process itself, it's rather time consuming. But by doing this, we are able to get them to pay what they can afford, which is 25% of the income. So that's the money payment for being in the program. And the CP of the town, therefore, will not have to pay as much toward their housing because they are paying part of it. And the other part of it is to help them negotiate between the repairs that they need to do and the issues that they have with their neighbors that we help manage that with their participation to work with the landlord to talk about the disposal is not working, the shower head is broken. So all that housing part, they have nothing to do with the casework. So therefore we do have to spend about an hour of 10 minutes, an hour, 10, 15 minutes to do all these negotiation for them. So therefore that's how we budgeted the $60 for this coming uh, phase three. And uh, the third question you ask is, how much do they pay if they can afford to pay? Well, we do charge them 25% of their income. So for people who receive SSI, the average they spend about $885, putting it into their housing and therefore CPA doesn't have to pay as much. However, I want you to know about 45% of them when they first enter our program, they do not have any income at all. So their ability to contribute is zero. The fourth question asked was, do we help them with the mass health application? We do. We have a caseworker, as I mentioned, come from Healthcare for the Homeless in-house. She comes once a week and she helps people apply for mass health. And the fifth question, what is the representative payee that was referred to in the support service 2C. And the representative payee is designed for people who are not able to manage their finances, such as pay for utility bills, pay for phone bills, pay for program fees that they have, such as the senior center. Uh, they will re we will refer them to senior center to work it out with our uh, uh, pro with a state agency that can provide a representative payee. So that's what the representative payee is for, to help people manage their uh, finances. And the last question is whether any money from CPA is ever used for support service. And the answer is no. All the programs we provide, such as housing application, such as man helping them to build their uh, financial stability to get a job, to apply for security, disability income, or to help them manage their wellness, do physician referral, do social uh, mental health provider referral. Or last thing is about how to get rid of your credit, you know, issues that you are struggling with, how to get rid of, uh, get rid of your uh, uh, Corey issues. Those are things that we have to kind of help them manage in order to be attractive when they uh, apply for public housing. So these are legal realms that we do what we can and we do have uh, legal avenues that we can secure for them if the situation is a little bit more complicated. So there's no money ever used for the support service that we provide. So these are the six questions that I received this evening. So that concludes my uh, representation and I am so grateful for your attentiveness and I'm ready now to receive any questions that you might have for me. Any further questions? Andy, you're muted. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, this is actually, this is wonderful to hear. I have a couple, they're probably short questions, but I have a few uh, and also just partially my curiosity too. Um, <laughs> Do your benefit, so does it primarily go to individuals or is it also possible that you might have like a single mom uh, with a kid that, uh, that could be part of your program? Right now we focus on individuals. So okay. most of the people who come in the program, they are singles, women, men, and families. We refer them out to other agencies because the state has a right to shelter law. 
And so the state agency, they will take care of homeless families if they are eligible for. But the state of Massachusetts does not have something comparable as called right to shelter for homeless individual men and women. All right. Uh, and then uh, another quick one is just, do your graduates typically stay in Amherst? Graduate, do they stay in Amherst? Yeah. They have roots in Amherst. So most of the people, they secure housing, they stay in Amherst. But rarely, they might end up going to, for example, I have a couple of them, they are over in Springfield because it's easier for them to find housing there compared to in Amherst. But by and large, they stay put, stay here because this is their network. This is their support system. And we provide post-housing support. So that makes it easier for us when we do the post-housing support to them as well. But everybody is a phone call away, a Zoom meeting away, a text message away. Very good. Thanks. And thanks for all you do. Appreciate the answers to those. Thank you so much, Andrew. Pam. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Wei Ling. Uh, question for you. I looked at the HUD requirements for definition of chronic homeless. Um, how do you prioritize whom you choose? to be chosen for, to receive the benefits? And secondly, how do you define uh, Amherst resident? Uh, it's a one year time period to be uh, minimum homeless repeatedly, but do you have a residency issue of six months as an example, or how do you do that to determine their Amherst residency as well? Thank you, okay. Sam, for the question. Uh, to answer your question, there are three criteria they have to meet in order to be considered to be in the supportive housing program. The first one is that they have to be homeless for at least one year mm -hmm. or four times in a span of three years that sum up to be one year. So that's homelessness. They have to be at least a whole year add up together. And the second criteria they have to have is that they have to be an Amherst resident. As you know, people who are homeless, they are very fluid. They go where there is a bed, a shelter. They go where there's social service for them. So we rely on the verification of our partner, Craig Stores. When they have people stay at the shelter for the duration of the shelter, that we oftentimes ask for the verification from them because Craig Stores is located in Amherst. So once you stay in Amherst, stay at a shelter, you are considered to be an Amherst person. And the third criteria they have to have is that they have to be demonstrating that their needs are so high that they will benefit from intense casework. So we do have a screening device, uh, which is called a three county assessment and we use that tool to score them on the areas whether it's the substance abuse whether the mental health whether their antisocial behavior just we add up all the score the higher you are the higher we're going to get you in so in in essence there is a prioritizing depending on the more you need the more deficient you are the more likely you'll get into the program so we don't take the easy ones, because this is not the purpose of a supportive housing program. So if I heard you correctly, uh, regarding the definition of Amherst resident, there's not a time element affiliated with that, but rather it's whether or not they've been determined to be so based on Craigslist, if they have stayed there mm -hmm. uh, for any particular period of time, is that correct? Um, they have to, we also, you know, because we are a social service agency working with more than just Craig Stores uh, shelter guests. They see about 160 people a year, unduplicated. And in our caseload, we work with about 700 plus unique individuals. So many of them, they don't stay at the shelter, but because we work with them year in and year out. So we know they are a regular presence in the town of Amherst. So if they receive service from us or they go to the survival center, they go to the soup kitchen, not for alone, then we know that they are in Amherst. 
So when you have a couple of individuals with high scores on your screening process, I'm curious, it must be a dilemma for you to determine which to choose for a limited number of slots. Uh, does that occur where there are close choices and you have to face that dilemma? I, I do this all the time. And it's heartbreaking for me when I had to choose one over the other. So that's why I'm so glad, Sam, you asked this question. I'm here today to ask you to increase our three vouchers, which is what you have given us for funding for. Let us to do six vouchers instead, because there was one year overlap between uh, the phase one and phase two. We were able to demonstrate to you there were six vouchers then, in that year, 2018, when there's an overlap, we were able to manage the six vouchers between those two, phase one and phase two. And we were able to meet the needs. So today I'm before you wanting to ask you, please let us have the vouchers that we know that we can definitely use to benefit all things considered besides the usual three vouchers. I'm expecting there will be more needs given the COVID-19, given the bad economy, all these confluences of factors is going to make it even harder. So I hope that you will consider really to provide the six vouchers that we could benefit, that we could provide to the folks. So thank you for this question. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I just want to play, I just want to play timekeeper a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We've got another one on docket. Yeah. All right, I see no more hands. So we thank you very much, Waylene, for coming tonight, telling us so much about this successful program. Thank you so much and wish you all a very good evening and I'm gonna go have dinner now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. And bringing in Shannon Sherry. Hi, Shannon. Oh, there's. Hey, guys. Uh, Sharon, uh, who else should I bring in? I see Austin raising his hand. Austin and Kent Ferber and Cindy Harbison. Oh, my. Did everybody? <laughs> yes. And everybody, thank you so much for having us. Uh, Austin Sarant, uh, the president of the Jones Library Trustees, he's going to start us off. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for your consideration of uh, our proposal. Uh, we've submitted, in addition to the proposal, a memo, which kind of locates a little bit of the proposal in the uh, context of what we've done in the past. Did you all receive that memo? Yes. My muted. We received it kind of late afternoon. So I have read it. I'm not sure everyone has read it, but we certainly will have read it. Well, it's a deal since we received the, the, the questions <laughs> later than you received the memo. In well, any case, <laughs> I, won't, oh. uh, I, won't, I won't go down that, that particular line of, of lateness. Uh, just let me say that this proposal is in some ways substantially revised from the last one that you've seen, and in some ways... Uh, similar. It's similar in the sense of it seeks uh, CPA funding to uh, do some work that is necessary to the preservation of special collections um, at the Jones Library. You know that special collections is a treasure in this town. And indeed, tonight we just had a library chat, which we talked about special uh, collections uh, with uh, Cindy Harbison, our special collections librarian with Michael Kelly from the archives at Amherst College with uh, Jane Wald and Robin was also gracious and Robin Fordham was gracious enough to join us. What came out of that conversation was yet again an affirmation that special collections at the Jones Library plays an indispensable role in the cultural and historical life of the town. Uh, what its special collections provides is not duplicated and cannot be really duplicated 
by anything that is done um, in the colleges at Amherst or Hampshire or the University of Massachusetts. The other thing I just want to call your attention to is that one of the issues that came up with the last proposal was the absence of a, a budget, uh, carefully laying out the cost of each of the items. Uh, we provided you that, uh, that budget. And we will, uh, in a minute, answer the written questions that you've uh, provided. So what I'd like to do now is to introduce Cindy Harbison, who's going to say a little bit about special collections, and then uh, Kent Ferber, who's the co-chair of the Friends Development Committee, is going to answer uh, a few of your questions, and I'm going to come back to answer another one of your questions. Cindy. Uh, thank you. Um, so the history of Amherst is rich and it lives within the walls of the Jones Library. Um, it's really the history of Amherst that um, we're collecting. Uh, residents come here to use uh, maps, account books, diaries, deeds, newspapers, family papers, organizational records, and so much more. Um, we're the repository for some of the town's official records. Uh, we have the Amherst tax records where you can find out everything from uh, who in Amherst owned enslaved people in the 1700s to when houses were built to how many cows Emily Dickinson's father owned in 1863. He had two. Um, we have the fire department's historical records um, and they tell you uh, um, a lot about the oh so many fires that Amherst experienced um, and things like the diaries, letters, and scrapbooks have helped first and second graders begin to understand what farming uh, in Amherst was like 200 years ago. Uh, we also have um, a rich literary heritage um, in our collections. Um, we're out of space, so we can't collect uh, the history of Amherst and in, to its greatest degree and really the records that reflect the diversity um, of the town. And um, we also have uh, risks of, um, because of an outdated HVAC system, which is the crux of our proposal. Um, the HVAC system has failed multiple times in the last five years, uh, causing four leaks. Um, the latest leak occurred this summer and uh, we, have 157 books that were water damaged and rare volumes by Noah Webster, Helen Hunt Jackson, Edward Hitchcock, and Julius Lester, uh, among uh, others, as well as very rare imprints from the early 19th century were all damaged. Um, parts of the manuscript collections were damaged, including some of the First National Bank of Amherst records and the Kinsey Garden scrapbooks. Uh, the Henry Jackson photograph albums, which are one of the library's only collections documenting the Black community of Amherst in the 19th century, were also affected. Um, the equipment that failed is at the end of its useful life, and there is no way to reconfigure it to prevent a similar failure in the future. Moving the collections elsewhere is not a feasible option because there is no other climate-controlled secure space in the building, and storing the collections off-site is far too expensive and makes them difficult to access. Um, currently, the shelves are covered with tarps to prevent, prevent further, protect them from further le leaks. Um, this seriously impedes access to them. Um, they're blue, and my favorite color used to be blue until I had these tarps because you have to go under them to get anything, and it's, it's like going into a cave. It's just terrible. Um, a safe, secure, climate-controlled storage space large enough to house the entirety of special collections is an essential part of preserving our collections. Um, so they will be accessible for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Cindy. Uh, Kent is going to answer, I think, uh, the first few of your questions, and then I'll speak to the to the last one. Kent. You. Okay, great. You can hear me. Thank you. Um, I should clarify that I am. Um, both the co-chair of the Friends Development Committee, but I also been a member of the Feasibility and Design Committee for this project since we started on it in 2014. And so I've been central to it from the beginning. And in fact, was closest to the preparation of this proposal 
uh, as anyone. So that's the reason I've been asked to respond to these questions. We can, we'll be happy to provide something in writing, but just to uh, give you a quick oral answer. Um, so the first one was indicate the uh, north, the direction of north and the center of the front door of the library on the plans. And if you look at exhibit D and E, I guess, or uh, C, uh, north, the entrance to the library is to the left as you look at the, the um, if you take the, my little text box identifying the exhibit at the top of the page, the entrance to the library is to the left. So you come in from the left and the original 1928 building is the L-shaped uh, 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 with it, one leg of the L parallel to the street, you enter into that and then another leg perpendicular to the street going back. Um, the second question is I can't tell whether construction rehabilitation for the exhibit and reading room areas is included in this proposal as opposed to the larger Jones renovation effort. The estimate that you have includes all of the special collections um, area, including the exhibit and reading rooms. It does mean that at least in this version, part of the special collections facility is not in the 1928 building. It's a relatively smaller part, uh, but it's, if, and, and what, the, what the consequence of that difference is, is remains to be seen, but um, part of the expense uh, in the estimate is for the special collections and um, for the exhibit and reading room areas. Um, the third question was, does the budget for items two and three on page six, including materials for use in the exhibit and our reading room spaces or only for storage? And if you go to the very last exhibit, um, which is the separate estimate for, uh, what's it called? Um, for the, um, the uh, cases and um, movable shelving, you'll see it's broken out. So some is for the reading room, some is for the special collections workroom, and some is for storage area. Um, the fourth question is the list of funding sources includes $500,000 in CPA funds. Does this indicate a likely request to us next year? Likely is the operative word. Operative word. I can't say. Uh, we are doing two major um, uh, historic preservation. We're reaching two histor major historic preservation objectives with this larger project. One is to secure these special collections, the artifacts, the, the, uh, the, the papers, the documents, et cetera. And the other, however, is also to restore a good part of that 1928 building that has nothing to do with special collections, the exterior, uh, windows, um, some, there's a great number of rooms inside the historic building that are not available to the public. We'd like to make them available to the public. So that would be a separate project. Uh, we probably will apply, but that hasn't been determined yet. Primarily because we don't know exactly what we're going to do in the way of historic preservation of that original building. We'd like to do as much as possible. Um, it's a major commitment of the trustees but we don't have enough detail yet to, um, for, to describe a, pro a proposal for you. And so I can't say whether we would come back. And then the last question, are any of the items in special collections in danger of being transferred to another owner? I think that's for me to answer, Austin. Kent. I'll defer to Austin for that. So uh, the, the answer to that question is yes, and you've, you've already heard why. So we're out of space in special collections. That means Cindy, as the person who's responsible for special collections, is already in triage mode. And uh, if we're not able to uh, create more space in special collections, hard choices are going to have to be made about what is taken in, what is retained. Uh, at the library chat today, this question was asked, uh, would it serve the town of Amherst if its special collections were dispersed? Uh, housed in the libraries at Amherst, UMass, or Hampshire, or stored elsewhere? And the answer that we got from Jane Wald and um, uh, Mike Kelly was absolutely not. The town is well served by a vibrant special collections and an integrated special collections. So if we cannot um, 
do what we think we need to do with special collections, which is to uh, afford more space, then yes, some very difficult choices will have to be made about what it is that is kept and what it is that is um, what it is that is not kept. Uh, I just also want to just remind us that we're talking about five items uh, in this proposal. We're talking about the HVA system, HVA. C system, the fire suppression system, compact shelving, display cases, and the cost of creating space. What we've asked for is less than the total of uh, those, um, uh, those, those, those items. But those are the things that we are going to be uh, doing if we are um, funded through uh, C CPA. So we're happy um, to uh, entertain any other questions you have, Sharon. Cindy, Kent, uh, my, and myself. And again, thank you for your consideration. Do any committee members have questions? Sam. What's the exterior closure on the Fennessy Consulting Services? Let's try to understand what that is. I, I'm asking because it says exterior. Yeah, Kent. Uh, um, I, I, On page number six of fantasy in the overall summary item number B20. Um, I you can always I, respond at another time, but that's yes, a question that I had. I'd Good. be happy to clarify that. I assume that means that some work needs to be done on the exterior wall of the original building uh, that would make it slightly different than the um, entranceway now. I do not, I can't answer that. So we'll, we'll get you the answer, Sam. Okay. Anyone else? Andy. Yeah, I think I probably know the answer to this, but I'd, I'd love to hear, just kind of hear it. Um, you, you know, you're, I guess obviously out of space, lots of issues with the space. Um, what what is like your realistic plan B if, <laughs> if you can get this? I mean, like I know that um, we're, we're facing obviously tough decisions in terms of what you take and what you wouldn't take. Would you just stop taking things in? Would you actually look to maybe? Would you realistically have to look to offload some of those assets to other locations or? Um, you know. So this is a policy. This is a policy decision that the library director, working with Cindy, will have to make. So I'm going to defer to Sharon and Cindy. Uh, if you want to try to give a little more detail to the answer. Sure. So uh, my thought process is kind of so it really has to do with. So here's the here's this massive expansion renovation project that we're proposing, and if the town turns that piece down, then I think what we would end up doing is, is we need to go and uh, repair the building. So we would be applying for JCPC funds. So it would still be the town doing the repair piece. And then ultimately, you know, the amount of space that we have left over, that's when Cindy would have to step up to the plate and decide, uh, you know, take a look at so here's Amherst here's her collection development policy and and what fits and 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 go from there but Cindy you're up um, I think we would have to make hard choices about what is I mean we already have to turn down records that I would really like to have and really document the the town and I already don't do any of the outreach that I would love to do to um, people and organizations that I would love to just spread the word and you know establish those relationships so that we could you know hopefully one day have those records. Um, in terms of of the space, um, I can't see the tarps working long term, so we would have to. Um, make some decisions about the, the only solution I've come up with thus far is to turn the exhibit room into the reading room and the reading room into a storage space. Um, and that would mean that we would lose a lot of um, space for 
you know, we couldn't have the class visits that we had and it still wouldn't be a, a truly climate controlled space. Um, so it's, there, there is no good option B. There is, Andrew, there is no good option B. That's part of the problem. The library was asked by the town council to do a repair estimate on the building. Uh, and the uh, estimate was between 14 and $16 million to deal with maintenance of the building. Uh, if we're gonna maintain the building, if we're gonna make changes, then we're gonna have to make the building accessible and bring it up to code. That's covered in that 14 to $16 million uh, figure. That 14 to $16 million figure does not include any money for rearranging of spaces in the, um, in the, in the library. So if we were forced with, to sit, stick within the existing footprint, again, we'd have to make hard choices. Do we take away space from kids or do we take away space from the reading room or do we take away space from the Burnett Gallery to accommodate special collections? And you know, again, that's a, that's a set of contingencies that we have not yet uh, gamed out and hope we won't have to. Thanks for your presentation, thanks for your answer. Any other questions? I have one, I really just to make very expl explicit, the VA HVAC system, the special HVA system, the special fire suppression systems, these serve only the special collections facilities. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Oh, Sam, yeah. A uh, couple questions. On page six of the Jones presentation, not the fantasy, there's a caveat, which obviously is necessary. This is, it must be emphasized. However, these are preliminary designs and not construction documents. Considerable adjustments and refinements may made, remain. However, there is no reason to believe the Special Collections Archives facility will be located anywhere else. I'm, how confident are you that the design destination as indicated, and I believe it's exhibit C, is in fact that design. I recall from the prior presentation, there was uncertainty. And I asked this because the presentation uh, proposal references special collections, but it's incorporated in a much larger project. Uh, so that makes one wonder if there's a, you know, a greater likelihood of it moving or not. And I think it's significant, even if you don't, can't, cannot guarantee. So, you know, how confident or certain are you that that's where it's going to be? Do you, is it minor adjustments that might occur? Or might you actually say, no, wait a minute, we're going to this other location? So I'm about as confident in the location of special collections as I am that Joe Biden is going to carry Massachusetts. Okay, that's pretty confident. Uh, is there a possibility that Joe Biden would not carry Massachusetts? Yes. Uh, but is it a likelihood? No. We're through the schematic design phase. A lot of work is going in to getting us through the schematic design phase. So we're pretty sure that the location of the things as we have shown them is what it is going to be. Now, there may be some adjustments, as you know better than I, as you go from schematic to design development, there might be some adjustments here or there. But it would really require that we almost go back to ground zero, which we are not going back to, to take special collections and put it and put it somewhere else. So uh, I think we're, 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 we're pretty sure. <laughs> that this is where it's going to be. And as a follow-up, given the scope of the overall project, uh, particularly what the detail that was provided last spring, um, <clears throat> if for any reason something were not to occur with the needed funding for the overall project, uh, I realize this is a contingency request, but it would is. this be rendered null and void or would the library trustees envision using CPAC money, CPA money, to enhance 
the special collections in the existing basement footprint? Or is that simply a later issue? Has that? I think, Sam, again, Sam, I think it's a, it's a really hard, a really good and really hard question. And the answer is we are, we're nowhere near thinking about what happens um, if we don't get this, we don't, we, this doesn't work. We know what will happen, which is the town will face a 14 to $16 million repair uh, bill. But beyond that, you know, we've been working really hard <laughs> to get through the schematic design phase on the renovation and expansion, which uh, I would characterize somewhat differently than the distinguished library director. It's a modest expansion. It is not a massive expansion of the building, but it has taken us a really long time to do all that work. So that's a long way of saying, I just don't, I just don't know. We're obviously not going to just sit by whatever happens and watch special collections, you know, kind of deteriorate and disappear in the Jones library, but, but we don't really have contingency plans beyond what we're asking you to think about with us. I, I have one other. Um, on page three of the cost estimate, there's a reference to conditions of construction used for the estimate, referencing a start date of March 22, March of 2022, yeah. construction period of three months. Um, is that a filler or is that actually a perceived time frame was that just what they used to create their their contribution to the estimate saying okay if we were to do this task in the month of march of 2022 this is what we envision it would take under ideal circumstances or is that it, it seems like it's hard to plan that far ahead uh given the, the scope and dynamics of uh the decision trees that you have yeah, I think it's more the, I think it's more of a of a kind of filler because I think you've just named it. I mean, we're we've asked the town council to um, a vote to approve the project in April of twenty one. Of course, we've just asked them to do that. We don't know whether, and they've got six months beyond the time that we uh, get the MBLC grant, which should be in July or maybe August of uh, this upcoming summer. So I I, I wouldn't. Uh, um, I wouldn't want to put a lot of, you know, stock in that's going to be in March of 2022, as opposed to May of 2022. Or whenever. Yeah, that was my assumption. I just yeah. to clarify. Okay, any more questions? I see none. So I want to thank you all. Thank you. All our visitors on behalf of the Jones. Thank you so much. much. And thank you very much for your proposal and your time tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, so old business that could that concludes the presentations for tonight. Uh, old business. Uh, just one quick thing, one or two very quick things on signage and kind of marketing from Sam. Anthony, do you have the capacity to show a couple of images? We've been in communication with Dave Zomack, who, and, and prior to that, Sonia and uh, Holly and others from the town. And uh, we've been fortunate that they've been able to generate examples of signage from our ongoing discussions that uh, we can consider. Sarah uh, M. Marshall and myself have looked at the uh, examples that were generated with our input and by um, Angela Mills. Thank you to David and, and to Angela. Uh, and we just wanted to show a couple that Sarah and I thought were um, the better ones are more appropriate. One of which is we envisioned down the road of the committee having administrative fees so that we can have signage wherever it might be. This, this project was funded in support of the CPAC. We need to get the word out. Uh, and so one of them, which has green is for general permanent signage. And the other is for plaques that may or may not exist inside of 
buildings. Uh, there's one typo on it, which is the letter F should be smaller case, not larger case. But this is the summary of the phraseology we agreed with and the general mock-ups that the town staff has come up with that we just wanted to show to you, if you're able to. If Anthony can find <laughs> Sam, I'm sorry. I have your email saying I will have the signs, but I don't see an email that actually okay. has the signs. Well, it was late this afternoon. And I'll read it to you then. Nonetheless, it's not a significant issue given everything that we're talking about, but let me open one up on my end so that I can read. And we can send this another time. There's no urgency here. You can, you can share your, Sam, you can share your screen if you okay, want to. Okay, how would I do that? Let's see. It's a bottom middle, green button, share screen. Share screen, okay. What's that Eddie Arnold song? Welcome to my world. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Look at my desktop. <laughs> uh, and this is, it's all actually buried in another folder. This is my workplace, but let me scroll to the top. If I'm able, it's open. So here are two signs. Um, these were generated by Angela. Option one, this is what we're envisioning, something along those lines for project signage. Uh, simple, this project was supported by Community Preservation Act funds. And if possible, if it's not problematic from a production standpoint with all the varying years, we'd put the year in. Uh, it's got the Amherst logo. You know, the colors may change, but this is the general concept of what we're considering for uh, signage. Uh, separate from this is uh, this, we envision plaques at some point. We've seen metal plaques that exist elsewhere that are smaller, just a nice one inside that would be non-intrusive. Uh, we didn't reference metal, but uh, Angela and Dave came up with the idea. So this is kind of what we're thinking of, something along this lines that would go inside buildings if there were, um, you know, a church, a private facility, that we wanted to reference that some of our funds had been utilized, this would be something that could hang. The thought is that uh, Dave and the town staff would determine all the logistics of how things go from point A to point B. And the committee is just coming up with the phraseology and the recognition that it's something we wanted to go forward to. This is what Sarah and I, these two came up with after the input from various individuals. I just wanted to show it to you. Uh, so those that's the current status of uh, signage. I don't know if you have additional comments. Dave, I see that you're here. Um, if you do, uh, or even if you don't, feel free to chime in. I would add that I could imagine having to replace the words, this project with something a little more specific, like renovations were supported by, you know, so, because if it's in a building, what exactly is this project? But anyway, we're just showing you the, the direction which we're moving, not asking for any decisions at this point. Um, but if you have any comments, certainly. And go ahead. Another point is there may be the, the thought of having a banner for, you know, if there were a large project such as the, uh, Northampton Road project or even future developments, uh, you know, such as the work that was on Grove Park, there could be a banner display that's roll up, roll out that we can put up that says your funds being utilized, your CPA funds. Are, work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Down the road, that would be in a determination with the town staff in terms of how it would look. But that's where we're, uh, that's the direction we're headed in. And one other uh, thought is, we did, I was able to acquire the prior Facebook uh, page and credentials from a former administrator uh, of the committee. And uh, it is currently listed on the town site. Uh, let me see if I can find it. And what I wanna do is invite everyone present to follow the page and like it. The motivation is just the more people who look at the websites that we have in the town that reference the CPA committee and the C what the CPA does, the more interest there may be in the future for town project submittals and being a community-based no. committee and an organization that's within our objective. So 
this is what the page looks like. I'll ask Sarah Marshall probably, or someone to, or Anthony to send you the link so you can click on it. Well, we don't, we don't know who's on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, you're on it. just, you know, look for. The link, <laughs> the, the link is actually on the CPA page. It is exactly. And that's where I'm looking to migrate to, but I have too many pages open. This is it. Yeah, it's fine. It's, it's fine. If people are on Facebook, they'll, They'll so figure it out. You, but, and you can find it on the page, but you know, that's small steps. And, you know, part of the objective of getting the word out regarding some of the great things and great projects that come our way. And maybe they'll, as we go forward, be some other ideas coming from the community as we uh, reach out at various, you know, COVID doesn't help, but this is where we're at for now. So that's what I have to say. So, just, I guess, quick clarification. Um, so this is something you, you said you're not looking for input or, or like- I said, no, we're not looking, asking for a decision, but if you certainly have comments on what you've seen, go ahead. Okay, no, I mean, I, it's the first time I'm seeing it. So no, yeah. I just, I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me whether this is like you're seeking all of our input or this is like, this is where we are and you're just providing- It's, a, it's an update. We've, we've had, this issue has come up at several meetings in the past. So we just thought we'd take it to a little subcommittee. So here's where we're at. It's an update. All right, very good, thanks. Sure. Okay, well, if on further reflection, you wanna send me any comments on that or to Sam, please do. Um, topics, the chair, I don't have any topics I didn't anticipate. Anthony, do we know the lineup for the next meet? Sean is waving his hand. So, oh, sorry. so I, I think was elected chair on this. And we're going to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, we'll be meeting weekly, at least for the next few weeks. Get through these, um, the rest of the presentations. All right. So, uh, yes, elect a chair and vice chair. Um, we could do that now, uh, but we still don't have every, <laughs> everybody here. Uh, I don't know if our two new members would feel ready to have an opinion about uh, voting on anybody, or we can just, again, kick it, kick it to uh, your meeting. David here. I think we need to move forward, and I would like, if the floor is open for a nomination, I would like to nominate you as a well. <laughs> I would say Sarah Marshall as the chair of our committee. I'll second the nomination. Okay, I do not refuse. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's all in favor of my being the chair, I think for this, this cycle, this season, or you know, until next fall, raise your hand. Sarah, do we need a roll call vote? Well, um, sure. All right. Sarah Mo Marshall votes aye. David aye. Williams. David Williams votes. David, aye. aye. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sam. Aye. Andy. Yeah, I guess normally like some discussion. I, it's it's almost like picking out the hat for me since I just met all right. of you. But um, you know, you you clearly already seem to be. Um, <laughs> well in control of this this uh, committee so like i've got no good reason to say no but i've been inclined to abstain since that's i fine. Uh, yeah that's fine abstain okay diana i vote aye robin aye anna i have similar thoughts to andy um but i also don't want to hold the vote up if i if losing my vote would hurt that so I would like uh, well, to. Well, I think we have five votes in favor. So right. All right. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll abstain as well. Thank you. Okay. So five in favor, two abstentions. All right. Diana. I would like to nominate Sam for vice chair. I second. What do you say, Sam? Uh, I accept the nomination. All right. We'll do that. Any discussion? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> want to contest it? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. We'll do it again. Sarah Marshall's in favor. 
David Williams. Aye. Votes aye. Sam. Aye. Andy. Abstain. Diana. Aye. Robin. Aye. Anna. Abstain. Thank you. Five to two. Okay, that's great. Um, then I think we are done, unless I have forgotten anything. No, I believe I believe that's all that's before us. All right. Well, um, to circle back to the to the um, the questions that we some of us prepared. Um, it's not too late to submit questions to Anthony for the remaining proposals. Yes. So. Yeah. If I I would say if I could get them Monday morning, so I can give the proposers a little more time to answer them than half a day. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay, and was, I mean, is anybody unclear about, I mean, you've, you, you've seen, it's it's what we did tonight, but it gives the um, applicants a chance to put it in writing. Yeah, no. Just a little time, maybe, so. Yeah, Sarah, I was just gonna say that I, I think my questions, and I'll, I'll connect Anthony with you offline, so um, if, if you're still good with that, but yeah, I think just the only questions I had coming out of today in the process is just what is flexible Right, like I, it sounded like people almost amending their proposals as they were presenting them in some cases, uh, and if that's within the the bounds of this, that's totally fine. Um, but it, the the submission process has been locked; it is completed. Right, no new applicants. So um, again, if that's precedent or if there's no issue with it, I don't have an issue with it. But um, uh, yeah, I'll just make that as a comment. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, so I have taken down the submission form. Uh, that said, there is no statute that governs when proposals have to come in. And in fact, last year we did entertain a proposal that came in in the middle of the year. Um, it would be up to this committee whether to entertain a new proposal if it, I, I bring that to you and say, are you interested in considering this at this time? It would depend if we had any money either. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, otherwise, it was very nice to to e meet all of you all. Right. And I guess we're just going to be doing this for foreseeable future. All right. In that case, uh, would anyone like to move to adjourn? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Sam, Diana moved in. Sam seconded. I think we don't need a roll call. Just raise your hand if you would like to adjourn now. Okay. All right, that's uh, so two, seven, seven eyes. All right, that this concludes the meeting then at 8.15. Thank you all. Thank, thank, you. thank you, nice to meet everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So Sarah, Bye. I hope Oops. you and I can follow up with Dave so that uh, they can start making plans. And sure, sure. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. All right.